It is the cold winter evening of the 11th of February, 1942. Dozens of German sailors bustle around aboard the German fast battleship Scharnhorst, ensuring the vessel is ready for an upcoming mission. The commander of the entire battle group, Vice Admiral Otto Zilliax, leans over the handrail on the ship's bridge to check the preparations on the similar battleship moored just a few hundred meters away. The Gneisenau was being fueled and loaded with necessary equipment. It seemed that within the next two or three hours, the group will be ready to finally depart the port of Brest. One of the most risky missions in naval history is about to begin. This video is sponsored by Curiosity Stream. Enjoy well-researched and insightful documentaries? Then we highly recommend you check out Curiosity Stream. Boasting a wide variety of thought-provoking subjects and topics, you're sure to be immersed in premium content. For fans of the channel, we strongly recommend the series Spies of War. Because as much as battles shape wars, so too can a single person in the right place. However, it isn't just conflict on Curiosity Stream. Science, technology, nature, and many other topics are just a click away. And as of this video, they are running a fantastic promotion. For less than $2 a month on their annual plan, you'll get full access to their film library. But if you use the link in the description below and use the promotional code BAZBATTLES, you'll also get a 30-day trial absolutely free. Available on all major platforms, Curiosity Stream has some of the top award-winning documentaries in the world. Follow the link in the description below and stay curious. It's the 1st of June, 1941. Appearing out of the morning mist, the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen enters the safe harbor of the German-occupied port of Brest to undergo much-needed engine repairs. Not a week ago, she parted ways with the damaged battleship Bismarck, which was soon compelled to fight her last battle against the overwhelming pursuit of the British Royal Navy. The demise of the Bismarck, one of the two newest and most powerful warships of the Kriegsmarine, led the German naval command to rethink the role of their biggest naval vessels in the ongoing Battle of the Atlantic. In the summer of the year 1941, the Kriegsmarine had three serviceable capital ships at their command. The second craft of the Bismarck class, the Tirpitz, was finishing crew training in Kiel, and the two smaller fast battleships, referred to as battle cruisers by the British, the Scharnhorst and her sister ship, the Gneisenau, both undergoing repairs in the port of Brest. Each of these three warships presented a serious threat to Allied merchant convoys steaming through the Atlantic and their very existence tied down a good portion of the British home fleet, whose main task was to keep the shipping lanes free of the German menace. In order to at least partially contain the potential of the Kriegsmarine, the British Royal Air Force was assigned with the mission of bombing warships anchored in German-controlled ports, in the hope to put them out of commission for as long as possible. These air raids proved to be rather ineffective in the case of the Tirpitz, as she was a relatively hard target located deep into the southwestern Baltic coast. But the other two battleships, moored at Brest Harbour, were subject to an almost constant barrage of bombing sorties flown by the Royal Air Force. Of course, these were dangerous missions for the bomber crews, performed usually at night and against heavy anti-aircraft defences around the port facilities, with small, barely visible targets. So it rarely yielded any significant results. But the sheer amount of attacks flown by the British were enough to keep the German warships out of service for a good part of 1941. The German naval command under Grand Admiral Erich Reder had a tough nut to crack. The fate of the Bismarck and the manner in which the British were able to track the battleship down in the Atlantic with the help of their superior radar highlighted the risk the Kriegsmarine had to consider while planning Atlantic service ship sorties against merchant convoys. The demise of the Bismarck convinced the Führer that all of his major vessels were little more than costly luxuries, especially closer to the end of 1941, when the Wehrmacht was enduring the first strains on the new front opened against the Soviet Union earlier that year. The idea of bringing the three warships from Brest back to home waters took hold when the British made a number of raids on German-occupied Norway, which made Hitler realize that the Scandinavian country could become a target for Allied invasion. Based on this, the Tirpitz was moved to the Norwegian fjords 
to both strengthen the German defenses there and also to attain a good forward base to harass Arctic convoys bound for the Soviet Union. The warships in Brest were to follow the same patrol, but the question remained how to safely move them back home unscathed. Now, Reda and the other high-ranked Kriegsmarine officers staunchly opposed this idea as there was literally no safe way to reposition the warships at Brest back to Germany. Every pass around Iceland or the Faroe Islands was fraught with danger and the only other option pushing through the English Channel was absolute lunacy, a suicide mission. But when the Führer heard about this option, his interest was piqued, much to Reda's dismay. As bold as it sounded, Hitler doubted that the British would be able to react quickly enough and concentrate enough naval vessels and aircraft to thwart the Germans' plans. As was often the case, once the Führer was fixated on an idea, there was no turning back. The command and the operational details were entrusted to the Vice Admiral Otto Ziliaks, who devised a plan for this reckless mission. The battle group was to secretly leave Brest under the cover of darkness to pass through the most dangerous part of the channel, the Straits of Dover, in daylight, hoping to catch the British off guard. The preparations were performed in the utmost secrecy. Even the majority of the crew aboard the German vessels were oblivious to their actual destination. The loading of some tropical equipment and uniforms helped to spread the deception and fuel the rumors that the battle group was preparing to steam south, possibly along the West African coast. The preparations were completed by February 1941, and the Germans waited for opportune bad weather conditions to start the mission. In the evening of the 11th of February, Admiral Ziliaks hoisted his flag aboard the Scharnhorst, preparing for their departure. Shortly before midnight, the three warships weighed anchor and, with an escort of six destroyers, sailed out of the port of Brest. It should be taken into account that the British were not completely oblivious to the German plans thanks to the Enigma codebreakers at Bletchley Park, who were able to decode a good portion of the enemy's communication. In fact, the British Admiralty were not only aware that the German battleships would soon leave Brest, but also had a plan in the case of an enemy attempt to pass through the English Channel. Yet, scarcely anyone in the British command expected such a bold move from the Kriegsmarine. In the meantime, the beginning of the German voyage looked promising. Ziliaks was lucky enough to evade the Royal Air Force patrols and even avoided being spotted by a British submarine meant to watch over sea lanes around Brest. Steaming in the dark at 27 knots, the unhindered German group was almost halfway through the channel, passing the Cherbourg Peninsula around 7.30 a.m. But Vice Admiral Ziliaks kept up his guard, knowing that his ships were moving through what was essentially the British front yard, and the most dangerous part of the cruise was still ahead. With each passing hour, the skies grew brighter and the morning weather heavily favored the Germans. A thick cover of clouds with frequent rain greatly reduced visibility and even the Luftwaffe fighter planes tasked with covering the operation as the ships passed Cherbourg had difficulty providing effective air support. Despite the bad weather, the British noticed the increased enemy activity in the channel their radar equipment, though often jammed by the Germans, detected Luftwaffe activity, while the Air Force patrols spotted some of the enemy motorboats moving to join Ziliax's battle group. Yet the British remained unaware of the three big warships crossing the channel and attributed this increased activity as some sort of rescue mission. The German dash carried on. It was 10 a.m. Around 10.30, a squadron of British Spitfires flew in the area highlighted by the radars to investigate. Upon encountering German fighters, one pair of Spitfires dived to avoid engagement, and to their astonishment, the pilots saw the German fleet spread out in a line beneath them. Avoiding anti-aircraft fire, they turned and hurried homeward, maintaining radio silence. Since they weren't looking specifically for the German battleships, it took roughly an hour for the report to reach the Admiralty. By this time, Vice Admiral Ziliaks was about to enter the Straits of Dover, surging at 30 knots. Upon hearing about the presence of the German battleships in the Channel, Prime Minister Winston Churchill commented, At all costs, the ships must be intercepted and made to pay dearly for their audacity. 
But despite Churchill's confidence in British military power, both the Royal Navy and Air Force struggled significantly to challenge the Germans in a timely manner. Out of 32 motor torpedo boats, only five were able to venture out into the channel with the hope of trying to scupper the enemy's plans. But this daring attack failed to even put a serious challenge to the outer ring of the fast German motorboats. The power imbalance was so high that after one pitiful torpedo attack and a brief exchange of gunfire, the British were forced to retreat. Shortly past noon, the German battle group entered the narrowest part of the strait, where they were engaged by the old shore batteries located near Dover. Though only four 9.2-inch guns had the effective range to challenge the group, a radar-assisted artillery barrage roared for 17 long minutes, but no British shell landed within a mile of the fast-moving German fleet, which managed to pass by the white cliffs of Dover unharmed. As the Germans were slipping away, the British frantically sought to scramble any available aircraft squadrons to attack Ciliax's fleet. It was a true challenge, since nobody really expected the Germans to perform such an outrageous maneuver in the middle of the day. Well past 1 p.m., a number of slow, obsolete swordfish torpedo bombers covered by Spitfire fighters performed another attack. While the fighters engaged the Luftwaffe air cover, the swordfishers attempted to fly close enough to drop torpedoes. A valiant attempt, but it yielded no results, and a few minutes later, the entire swordfish squadron was shot down. Though unsuccessful, the devotion and bravery of the swordfish pilots made a lasting impression on the German crews aboard their big modern warships. For the next couple of hours, Vice Admiral Ciliax was kept busy by an ever-increasing number of hastily prepared British air attacks. But none of these came close to slowing down the warships. Up until this point, the German admiral could have considered himself lucky, but at 3.30 p.m., the Scharnhorst hit a mine and a violent explosion shook the ship. The engines went silent, the ship's two compartments were taking water, and Ciliax immediately decided to move to one of the destroyers to maintain control of the whole operation. The group steamed forward, while the mechanics on the Scharnhorst desperately struggled to fix the damage and get the ship moving again. Half an hour later, the repair teams managed to put her back in motion, and the Scharnhorst built up a speed of 27 knots, trying to catch up to the rest. By 4 p.m., Bomber Command was able to scramble its entire squadrons of medium and heavy bombers. But due to the fast-moving targets and atrocious weather, only a fraction of the British bombers managed to find the German group. Time passed quickly, and with each hour, the chances of halting the German dash diminished. But then, a group of five First World War-era destroyers made contact and focused torpedo attacks on the Gneisenau. The British claimed two hits, but in reality, none of the projectiles found their targets. In exchange, both Gneisenau and Prince Eugen locked their guns on the last destroyer, the HMS Worcester, which soon suffered a heavy battering. Despite receiving severe damage, she survived the attack, as the German warships quickly resumed to pursuing their original objective. The British employed an increased number of naval vessels and aircraft to stop the Germans, but all this effort was futile. It was getting dark again, and Celiax's ships were already steaming along the Dutch coast, putting distance between them and the British Isles. In spite of the Gneisenau hitting a magnetic mine that evening, and soon thereafter, the Scharnhorst hitting another, by the next morning, the battle group reached Wilhelmshaven. The channel dash was successfully completed. Vice Admiral Ciliax was the first naval commander since the 17th century to pass his battle fleet through the English Channel, an achievement for which he was awarded the Knight's Cross. It was a German tactical victory which humiliated the Royal Navy and Air Force, revealing their flaws and shortcomings. But on a strategic level, the repositioning of the Kriegsmarine's capital ships significantly lowered its ability to challenge the British at sea and diminished its role in the later years of the war.